much like uh, Colin Renbrew from last night, I'm much more transfixed by the title uh, of this paper than, in, than actually the thing that it, it refers to. So, um, so yeah, just bear with me on this one. It's going to get a little weird. Uh, in the sec second chapter of A Thousand Plateaus, subtitled One or Several Wolves, Deleuze and Guattari offer an assemblage critique of Freudian psychoanalysis. Freud de developed this approach with his treatment of the so-called wolf man. As a child, the would-be wolf man developed a crippling fear of wolves, beetles, caterpillars, and butterflies. He told Freud of a nightmare he once had. And the slides don't work. <laughs> Sorry. It's weird. Press the little button. Okay. And this, this is a, a painting that he painted after, but he, he, um, he told him of, of a nightmare he once had. He dreamt that he woke up and looking out his window saw several white wolves in a tree all intently and disturbingly focused on him. Freud interpreted the wolf in the dreams rather than the wolves in the dream to represent the wolf man's negative relationship with his father, which had been suppressed into his subconscious and resulted in the wolf man's many fears. In this example of Freudian symbolism, the wild wolf is domesticated via the yoke of anthropocentrism and anthropomorphism. Wolves become wolf, wolf becomes human, and in so becoming, the wolf is further hollowed out as an empty signifier for human meaning, in this case, as far as I understand, standing for uh, seeing sex between parents. From an assemblage perspective, Freud's view of the world is wrong or mistaken. His approach is seriously flawed in its emphasis on consciousness over all else and its framing of the world uh, of fixed and eternally bounded entities. Freud's reductive tendencies dull the points of our wolf's teeth, clip her claws, separate her from the pack and from the assemblage. Building on Deleuze and Guattari's critique of Freud from a slightly different angle, Baberis de Castro asks us, who is afraid of the ontological wolf? His approach draws inspiration, one, from Deleuze and Guattari's attack on modern Eurocentric uh, dualisms, two, from their framing of animal bodies as assemblages of affects, and three, from their call to become animal. Important distinctions between Deleuzean assemblage thinking and Babers de Castro's perspectivism include slightly different notions of animal bodies and very different orientations to a meta-ontology. For Babers de Castro, the animal body is an assemblage of effects. For Deleuze and Guattari, the, this assemblage is comparatively much broader, not just including the wolf, but also the tree, the earth, the scent particles in the air, etc., etc. Uh, and also, perspectivism rejects a meta-ontology via its emphasis on local worlds, while assemblage theory is indeed a meta-ontology. I assume that Babers de Castro asked his question about the wolf in relation to another story that the wolf man shared with Freud. He remembered that as a child, he once pursued a butterfly, but in the midst of the chase, he was paralyzed with inexplicable fear. This forced him to cease the chase and to fear butterflies forevermore. Certain anthropologists and now archeologists are in similar pursuits related to the so-called ontological turn. The question is, will we follow through? Will we catch our ontological wolf? Or like the wolf man, will we suddenly lose our fervor? Will we develop a paralyzing fear? Will we revert to more traditional projects? For a select few archaeologists, the answer to Beberis de Castro's question is a resounding no. Critical thinkers like Alberti argue for archaeologies of risk and wonder, where we encounter possible instances of radical alterity and follow them in ways that uh, force us to question our own world and to generate fresh questions and angles of articulation with it. Rather than explaining difference away in terms of epistemology or worldview, ontological archaeologists seek to explore worlds otherwise. These approaches seek to make local animist or indigenous theory into archaeological theory. However, in my reading, some are ardently anti-representationalists, uh, regardless of local indigenous ontology. And uh, this anti-representationalism comes from Hanera et al.'s uh, model of radical essentialism. And I find this to be a key contradiction. It, 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 one's, we're going to be anti-representationalists or we're going to be local, uh, have local indigenous theory. I agree that these ontological propositions risk much, but not for the same reasons intimated uh, by many ontological archaeologists. I'll explore what I see as the advantages and risks of this adventure in worlding via my general experience and commitment to archaeologies of colonialism and archaeologies designed and carried out with indigenous communities. I center the discussion around a specific archaeological assemblage 
from an early 17th century Huron Wendat palisaded village in northern Ontario. I present my discussion in four parts. I problematize the term effigies. Uh, I show gaps in the post-colonial repertoire. And these first two sections, I'm very uh, happy about the ontological turn. And then I get a little bit more grumpy, as the instance when I actually drank some of that Colin Wren brew, I sort of started to get <laughs> negative. Uh, I start to get into this idea of meta-ontological moorings. And finally, I, I want to ask questions about the wolf in us. During the 16th century, Iroquois groups of Ontario began producing and using a wide variety of biomorphic smoking pipes, pendants, and other artifacts. These objects came in a uh, come in a variety of forms, most notably human, human animal, wolves, dogs, bears, owls, birds of prey, waterfowl, and snakes, some of which are pictured here. In passing, Ontario archaeologists often refer to such items as effigy objects with little critical attention placed on what this term actually implies for a particular context under discussion. How might we begin to rethink these objects and the associated terminology in light of the ontological arguments introduced at the beginning of this paper? To be sure, effigy is generically used to refer to any three-dimensional object that draws comparison with animal beings. In this conventional usage, it's typically assumed rather than observed that people created effigies in order to intervene in the world and influence the future. Such examples are often thought of as part of sympathetic magic, a form that Western scholars typically ascribe solely to indigenous people, as far as I know. Well, maybe that's not true. Anyway, 17th century Jesuits um, chronicle the few instances during times of epidemic disease of Hur uh, Huron Wendat people making human effigies of straw and attaching them to their houses in order to deter, deter demons from entering. It is unclear how this Jesuit reading actually relates to Huron Wendat worlds, but it does show evidence that such effigies might have helped mediate human relations with non human forces. Also, we see a dramatic increase in production and use of so called effigy objects during times of uh, known European introduced epidemics in the area. This general scheme associated with things like this, clearly privileges past humans over other ent entities. It detracts from the influence of the other beings and substances involved in the creation and use of these animal-shaped objects, including our part in these creations today. So indeed, we could ask, how did those other animal beings participate in this assemblage? What about intangible or more ephemeral beings like demons? Uh, how did the actual clay, stone, smoke, bodies, and germs participate in these becomings? Unfortunately, the term effigy used without much critical attention, evokes similar ontological schematic each time it is applied with little concern over essentialism. So ontological questions and local knowledge would be useful here, as, as would questions concerning becoming animal in the assemblage sense. I would also hasten to point out that we must not forget that actual archaeological practitioners also play an important role in these becomings, a role that I feel is occasionally overlooked in certain ontological arguments, certainly in archaeology. Now, you probably thought I was going to go on to say more about those effigy pipes, but you know what? I'm not going to. Um, in recent discussion of archaeologies of colonialism, uh, Chris Gosden argues that we must approach all aspects of colonial histories as foreign countries made up of a number of intersecting dimensions of strangeness. He also points to a very real gap in the archaeological literature on colonialism, a lack of engagement with new ontological questions. So we must ask what differences might ontological approaches make for those of us working in colonial contexts. Inspired by these argu arguments, I will briefly explore the limitations and assumptions associated with the main theories relied upon in such archaeology, at least in a North American context. And these are theories of practice in post-colonialism. As I see it, these ideas certainly help archaeologists to understand colonialism, but they do so by modifying and dulling our engagement with, to use Gosden's words, difference or strangeness. First consider uh, this object. It's a partially, uh, partial burned and unevenly calcined rosary of animal bone and silver. The rosary comes from the same Huron Wendat village as the so-called effigy objects introduced earlier. The field director who led the most recent excavation of the site interpreted this rosary as a possession of a Jesuit priest. She suggested that the rosary's presence in the village could indicate that it was also the site of a historically known mission. This type of commonsensical interpretation certainly denies or at least reduces our chances of engaging with those intersecting dimensions of strangeness. Within such a scheme, the complexities of the archaeological assemblage are not given their fair due. Second, let's consider the history of archaeologies of colonialism in North America. Um, acculturation upheld the dualism between ideal and material 
with the material world thought to reflect or directly correlate with cultural ideas and identities of the past. In this normative model, the beads must be Jesuit beads. If not, they must be the possession of a converted huron Wendat person. Practice in post-colonialism, of course, uh, gave us the means to critique this dualism by emphasizing the importance of what things did socially in the past, arguing that the material world was deployed strategically to construct and express identities in politically charged contexts. You are not what you own or what you make, so perhaps uh, these beads were used to navigate colonial politics in the village or to appear different from who a Huron Wendat person might have really uh, been. Despite surface differences, both of these caricatured approaches harbor similar ontological assumptions. With acculturation, material similarities uh, meant cultural similarities. Here, culture is perceived as a superficial mantle that can be changed rapidly and wholly. Uh, this mantle sits upon a deeper shared ontological status between colonists and colonized, of course. Uh, with practice and post-colonialism, the material record tells us of, of strategic essentialism, resistance, and political navigation. And this is surface dressing for a deeper, perhaps more traditional worldview or ontology that always escapes our questioning in these contexts. Both of these approaches are guilty of what anthropologist Mario Blazer critiques as saming. In acculturationist archaeology, when the material world became homogenized in colonial context, there wasn't anything left to study. All difference had been eliminated. In practice in post-colonial archaeologies, when the material world becomes homogenized, the process could have been part of political strategies of appropriation, mimicry, or resistance. But deep down behind these acts, all actors exhibit a universalized human condition, simply expressing it differently in times of struggle. For Blasseur, uh, these models assume, quote, universal applicability of the categories and the concerns emanating from a Euro uh, Eurocentric canon. What the ontological turn, of course, asks us to do is to move beyond these representationalist treatments while asking questions about radical difference. For an ethno-historic example of radical difference, we can read Jesuit records again in which priests recorded multiple instances of offering to baptize fatally ill Huron Wendat people. These offers were sometimes declined because the Jesuit fathers could not guarantee that baptism would prevent death, death only prepare the dying for the afterlife in a way that was suitable according to the Catholic worldview. I interpret this to indicate that the Sikh Huron Wendat people in question were quite confident of what happened after death in their world, and therefore found little comfort in accepting Jesuit ritual that did not serve medicinal purposes. For the Sikh Huron Wendat who accepted baptism in hopes of survival or rejected baptism with knowledge of what was really real for them in their future, ontological questions seem to fill gaps left by the practice in post-colonial inspired approaches, often, inspi uh, often relied upon in archaeologists of colonialism. The trick, of course, is to vo avoid both saming and othering, capital O, othering, a clear danger when it comes to ontological archaeologies. In several recent publications, I've critiqued certain ontological arguments for their tendency to other. I compare these ontological arguments with the essentialization of radical difference critiqued long ago by Edward Said in Orientalism. And it's worth noting here, of course, that Said focused on radical differences that were figments of European onlooker imaginations, not what was really real necessarily. The ontological turn instructs us to survey for the instance of radical difference. And once identified, we use this instance of alterity to challenge our understanding of the world. Assuming naivete, we proceed to reconstruct the character of this world. And I find this approach essentialist in that it de uh, denies possible instances of congruity between my world and that other world, or between Huron Wendat and Jesuit worlds in the past, worlds populated by both effigies and, and, and rosaries. Within a classical anthropological framework, the effigies cleave along uh, the other side of the sameness, other duality as the rosary. What we don't recognize as from our world becomes evidence for the Huron Wendat's radical otherness. What we do recognize from our world becomes evidence for colonial expansion, the history of us, and the transformation of Huron Wendat worlds. Indeed, to move beyond these colonial sensibilities, we need an ontological model that considers the rosary in concert with the effigies, a model open to multiple ontologies that intersect and overlap. And this is the world in which Jesuits and Huron Wendat conversed. And I would add, there also exists a world in which Amerindians met the Baris de Castro, and where Alberti and Marshall met the body pot, a world of exchanges, a world of semiotic mediations across boundaries. And having noted these connections and conversations, for me, the most heinous crime in certain ontological approaches in archaeology is the assumption that we, the archaeologists, can somehow partially strip away our own meta-ontologies and reconstruct past indigenous ontologies. 
As I noted recently in regard to Alberti's seminal writings on uh, South American body pots, not pots that represent bodies underlined, but single entities, body pots, if we strip away our, our Western or archaeological ontologies, how do we know that the pots resemble bodies? For that matter, how do we know that these things, about these things called bodies or pots? By overlooking our own semiotic engagements with the world, we deny some complicated, dare I say, representational processes while simultaneously suggesting that the best way to uncover indigenous ontologies of the past is through your nearest Western archaeologist who spends much of her time reading philosophy. As Matisse anthropologist Zoe Todd so succinctly puts it, the revolution will be mediated. <laughs> by people like me, apparently. Um, it is worth noting here that even Bavaris de Castro has been criticized for focusing solely on absolute differences, uh, giving his interpretations of Amerindian ontologies a dangerous, uh, timeless quality. It seems to me, with these radical ontological arguments, we would do well to remember the important work of Zoe Crossland, in which she assesses, not in the paper that she just gave, but in other things, she assesses forensic claims of the dead speaking from the grave, and I'm using my words, not yours. Uh, but she, of course, notes how the dead speak as part of complex assemblages of living and non-living entities, including, of course, the forensic scientists. Okay, I'm almost there. Uh, the rejection of meta-ontologies, such as various forms of relational ontology imported from European thinkers explored in many papers today, is based on the fact that we seem to be replacing one model of the world in which, say, dualisms persist, etc., with another where those dualisms are eradicated. Here it is worth uh, comparing the results of these new ontological, radical ontological forays, which promise to lead us into radically different worlds by take, getting, cutting our sort of ontological moorings. And so I'm going to give a quick comparison here. So body pots reveal, quote, that matter and physical form were considered inherently unstable, end quote. Holbred finds Aoife ontology as constituted by motility and transcendence. Marshall finds indigenous ontology of Northwestern North America where persons were not stabilized and marked out as particular kinds of being or understood to have fixed identities. Each of these worlds resembles post-humanist explorations of, of Deleuze and relational ontologies and vibrant matter. So perhaps relational meta-ontologies can indeed lead us in new and interesting directions. Uh, I understand that the purpose of these new ontological adventures is to generate new questions and new articulations with the world. I understand that. However, we need to ask whose risk and whose wonder. In my discussion, I hope it was clear that I believe it is the ontological archaeologist's wonder and the indigenous subject's risk. And it, this doesn't seem new or radically new. It seems like business as usual. In favor of this model, I advocate for a relational approach that is semiotically informed and that recognizes, and, and semiotically informed in the sense that, you know, semioticians like Oliver Harris has been doing ah. a lot of work here. Um, <laughs> semiotically informed. Uh, Unbelievable. Here, there's another Harris reference, by the way. And that recognizes... <laughs> Get, get ready, uh, and that recognizes multiple ontologies in the same line as Harris and Robb, and incorporates local knowledge. As far as my own work with indigenous archaeologists and communities go, it is quite useful to ask how ontologies compare, overlap, clash, but this doesn't involve trying to strip away my, on, my own ontological moor, moorings. Building on recent post-human assessments of fieldwork akin to Latour's analysis of scientific laboratories, we must pay attention to how the past emerges uh, between excavator, trowel, features, soil, rock, effigy pipe. But we must also maintain focus on the multiple different human actants and ontologies involved, from the tribal elder who watches over me as I work, to my indigenous colleague who digs with me shoulder to shoulder in the trench. Last spring, the Mohegan Archaeological Field School, which I run with the Mohegan Tribe of Connecticut, received Wendergren funding to study how, in such contexts, we remake archaeology. The funding supports ethnographic interviews and filming of our archaeological process to help understand how the past emerges from this heterogeneous assemblage and how archaeologists re-rot in the process. To conclude, I argue that we must remember to fear the ontological wolves without scaring them off completely. For if we focus too much on radical difference without attention to our own ontological moorings and to the indigenous people around us, we might overlook the fact that the wolf we chase is actually largely us, the analyst, wrapped tightly in a dusty old pelt that could be Orientalist to the core. Thank you very much for listening.